What would you do to protect the ones you love? To what limits would you go to protect the ones you love? And in some way, that question has an easy answer. Well, I get up, I go to work, I do the things that normal people do in normal society so that I can provide for my family. Maybe it's the moms who stay home and they say, you know, I do what I do every day to teach my children what it takes to be good people in this world, to be moral people in this world. I set the example for them. But that question can also take a little more serious and maybe even sinister tone. If someone hurts your child, would you kill them? To what degree would you go to protect the ones you love? And even not on a sinister side and not on a a trivial side, there's, there's the part where it's just kids get sick. Family members get sick. People whom we love, they become ill. And have we ever looked at those people and have we ever said, if I could take that from you, I would. If I could, if I had the opportunity, if I had the ability to take away your sickness and to carry it in myself, I would do that. I'm thinking of Elliot and Everett for a moment. <clears throat> they get, you know, kids get the crud, they pick up everything from everywhere. It's a snotty nose. It turns into a cough. It turns into a fever. It, it, you, know, you know how those things progress. And I can't tell you the number of nights I sat there holding one of them and said, if I could do anything to take this away from you so that you wouldn't have to experience it, I would do it. There's an activity I like to play, when, particularly whenever um, I'm working with junior high or high school, and it's always a scenario base. It's your friend has a serious illness, and the local pharmacist has a cure, but the medicine's very expensive. It's the only cure in all the world. It's the only cure there ever is going to be in all the world. Do you break into the pharmacy to get the medicine? Do you break into a bank to steal money so you can get the medicine? Do you beg, steal, and borrow to get the medicine? What what do you do? And I would say that at some points in life, when sickness, when trial, when difficulty comes, the answer is saying, I'll go pretty far if it meant helping take care of the ones I love. I'd move heaven and earth if it meant taking care of the people I love. Today in our text, what I believe is like a sick child, Jesus willingly took on our sickness and all that came with it so that He could remove it from us. He looked at us and He said, I can take that on and I will. And by removing the weight of sin from us, it allows us to express His love more fully. Our text for today is going to come from Matthew chapter 27, verse 32 and following. And what I want us to focus on primarily today is the suffering of Jesus. The things that He endured. Now, if you have the opportunity, and Chris Bergen reminded, of, uh, reminded, of, reminded us of this last week, when he said, think about the movie, The Passion of the Christ. So this morning, I want us to think briefly about the movie, The Passion of the Christ. But I want us to go beyond just The Passion of the Christ and to think of the emotional turmoil that went on, the spiritual turmoil that went on, and what all occurred there. Let's start off with reading Matthew 27, verse 32. And when we read... Matthew 27, verse 32 and following. What I want us to start with is the realization of His physical pain. 
the physical pain that Jesus endured. This is Matthew 27, 32. As they went out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name, and they compelled him to carry the cross. And when they came to the place called Golgotha, means the place of the skull, they offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. Then they sat down and kept watch over him there. Over his head they put the charge against him, and that read, This is Jesus, King of the Jews. When two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and the other on the left, those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. So also the chief priests, the scribes, the elders mocked him, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the King of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross. Then we will believe him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now. If God desires him. You know, Jesus, he claimed to be the Son of God. And along with all this, the robbers who were on his right and on his left, they reviled him in the same way. Now the sixth hour, that's about noon in the, the day, there was darkness over the land until the ninth hour. That's probably about three or so. In the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of the bystanders hearing it said, this man's calling to Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the other said, wait, let's see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. What I want us to do for a moment is I want us to realize the physical pain that Jesus endured in this moment. Mind you, the, the stuff that had happened prior to this, Jesus had had dinner with his disciples he had gone out to a garden to pray, and it was already nighttime when he's in the garden praying. And that's when Judas has run and gotten the cohort of people together to come and arrest Jesus. It's late already. And then Jesus is shackled, probably, hauled off, and he's thrown between various leaders for judgment. While he's with the Sanhedrin, they have no doubt hit him across the head because he made a comment against the high priest. No doubt there has been shame and ridicule even in the moments there among his own people. But he's taken to Herod. He's taken to Pilate. He's taken to multiple places where in each account, he is in some way physically hurt. Finally, at the very end of the physical hurts, the physical beatings that he's received along the way, he is now at the hand of Pilate who says, you know what, he doesn't deserve death. I know that, you know that, we all know that. He doesn't deserve death. So I'm going to send him over for a good whipping. We're going to, we're going to make sure that the stuff that he has done, people know about. He knows not to do it anymore. So he turns him over to a guard to be whipped with what we would call a cat of nine tails. It's the idea of the 39 stripes minus one because 40 was the part where you didn't go. But, but 40 was only a Jewish law. There's a question if the Romans even followed that. The reality is, is the Romans probably beat him until the guard watching him said, you know what, he's about to die, but he could still pull through. This cat of nine tails, if you know any about it, has 
maybe pieces of glass or rock or lead in the ends of it. And so as this guard is beating Jesus with this, those pieces of shrapnel, shrapnel are going in and tearing His body. Now first off, it tears very similarly to like a cut. We've all had cuts. Like a kitchen knife. Something that first is very trivial. But what do you do once you've peeled back skin on the human body and you start to tear into muscle? Maybe tendons. What happens when those lead blocks hit the sides of your ribs? Jesus is strapped to a post of some form to hold him, hold him up so they can do this process. And at this point, once he's near death, the guard says stop, he's done. They cut him loose. And then the crowd yells, we don't want him. And Pilate comes up with this idea of, you know, maybe we'll realize that Barabbas is an evil man. That's the backstory here. Barabbas is an evil man who deserves death. I mean, the crucifixion is set up for him. And Pilate offers them and says, well, let's just, I always release to you somebody. Why don't I just release to you Jesus? And they say, we want him crucified. We're introduced very early on in verse 32 to Simon of Cyrene because what Jesus would have carried is He would have carried the equivalent of a railroad tie up the mountain. It would have been what He would have been nailed to. And He was not strong enough. Enough muscles had been torn, had been destroyed, that He lacked the capability to carry this wood up the hill. And when he gets to the top, Simon carries it. Jesus is no doubt struggling to walk. They put three nails in him, presumably three. One in each wrist. Because in the wrist, you can hold the body up without destroying the body. Do it in the hand, there's a good chance the nails rip through the hand. There's actually a really small hole in one of the joints right here where a nerve moves through. The Romans were very good at finding that nerve. So the spike goes through. And then they put your feet in an odd position. And they put a nail through your feet. And death by crucifixion was normally a slow process. It was expected to take several days. What happens is your body's in an unusual position where your lungs cannot breathe well. Your arms are held up, so it constricts the ability for you to breathe. And the only way for you, you can breathe in, but the ability to breathe out is lacking. And so in order to breathe out, what you have to do is you have to push up on the nailed feet in order to get some air to move. So this happens at noon. And to three, Jesus is on the cross enduring that pain. I don't know fully what that pain is like. And I doubt that even the Passion of the Christ adequately tells what that pain is like. But I don't think the pain, the physical pain, is the pain that we are meant to look at. And I'll tell you why. How much of the physical pain is relayed in the Gospel account? Any of the Gospel narrative? None. What is relayed, though, in the Gospel narrative? Every time we read a Gospel account, it's not the pain, the physical pain. It's not the nails that we're told about. It's what the crowd is doing around Him. 
And instead of writing about what Jesus endured for our sake, we are told about the charge that's written above them. That's verse 36 and 37. We're told about the robbers on each side of Him that are railing against Him. We're told about the faithful Jews who are walking past and who are looking at Him and who are mocking Him. He said that He was the King of the Jews. Then surely He would be able to come down and off this cross. He said this, let Him do it. We will believe if He does this. He's healed people. He's fed people. He has brought people back from the dead. And they still do not believe. Do you think they'll believe if He comes off the cross? Oh, Jesus, if you come off the cross, I'll believe then. I don't think the physical pain is the pain we're meant to look at in the crucifixion. I think we're meant to look at the pain of sin in the world at the crucifixion. The religious ignorance of the people. Jesus, in this example, in verse 46, He says that phrase, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That he, he yells that. And their reply, their confusion, their ignorance is, well, He's calling for, for Elijah to come. Jesus is quoting. It's not a call for Elijah. But if they knew their Old Testament like Jesus knew it, they would have understood that this is from Isaiah. This is from Psalms. That Jesus is quoting Matthew's account, by the way. It's very interesting. Matthew's account of the crucifixion parallels perfectly with Psalm 22. Right before Psalm 23, the Good Shepherd. Psalm 22, if you read Psalm 22 in Matthew, you're reading the same thing. I'm looking at the religious ignorance of the people that are standing around. And then I think too, anytime I go through suffering, you know who I want beside me? Those I love. Man, when it's tough for me, I want my wife there. I want Mike there. I want you there. When life gets tough, I want you to give a phone call to get a card. I want that. Because you're my people. Where are Jesus' people? Well, there's some ladies at the foot of the cross. Mary, His mama's down there. John, the disciple whom He loved special, He's there. But where are the others at? How painful is it when you endure trials and you do not have anyone to stand with you? How much does it hurt when no one's there to hold your hand and no one's there to help? I think the pain of the cross is more a spiritual pain than it is a physical pain. And then I come across a question. Maybe I'm the weird one. But I say, why did Jesus have to suffer? Have you ever asked that question? Why couldn't... In this moment, they're off, they offer Him wine mixed with gall. That's basically like a, 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 a sedative. Thank you. I was going to say antiseptic, but that's the wrong word. That would do Him no good at this point. It's, like, it's basically a sedative. It, it would, in, the, in the way they were offering it to Him, it's designed for Him to last to not feel the pain of the cross. And what does Jesus do with that wine? He refuses it. What He's saying, and He's kind of like Josh when Josh gets a headache. I don't take Tylenol. I'll sit there and I'll, oh, my head's bothering me. I'll whine about it. I'll bellyache about it. And finally, Ashley will say, will you take something? That's what Jesus is doing here. Is he says, I'm not going to take nothing I want to fully embrace, fully feel the pain that I'm about to go through. They offer him the second wine. And this is interesting. The second wine is called sour wine. It would have been like opening a Sprite. Drinking a swig of Sprite. Got that good, it's got that good zest to it and it'd wake you up a little bit. It'd keep you going. Why in the world would Jesus, when given the opportunity 
to dull the pain, would He not dull it? And why, when given the opportunity to go ahead and expire a little quickly, decide that He's going to take an energy drink so that He could last a little bit longer? Why in the world does pain even have to be a part of it? That's a tough question. Hebrews gives us a, sl- a small answer. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10. And this is a, it's a tough one because it starts off the reason that Jesus suffered is for His perfection. Let's read this together. Hebrews 2, verse 10. In bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the pioneer of their salvation, that's Jesus, the one who was the pioneer for salvation. He was the first one to go on. He made the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what He suffered. Now, I typically think of Jesus as already perfect, so I struggle with this. But what the Hebrew author is saying, there's another word for perfect that could put, be put in there, and the word is complete. The idea is that He would make the pioneer of our salvation complete. Now, I already think Jesus is complete too. What do I do with it? What's the point that the Hebrew author is getting to? Mission accomplished. What else? Go a little deeper than that, please. Good thought, though. What did Jesus need to fully understand? He needed to fully understand humanity. He needed to know what it's like to truly hurt. He needed to know what it was truly like to feel the pain, to feel the turmoil to understand what it's like to give labor to a child. I don't know that pain, and I never will. They have these TENS units that guys can mock um, labor pains with. I don't know. I've seen horror films with them, but I I will never experience that. But you ladies who've experienced that, you know the pain of labor. And Jesus, His pain may not have been the same as labor pains, but you can bet His pain was very real, very serious. I don't know the pain of a kidney stone. Some of you do. And you know what? Jesus knows the pain as well. I don't know the pain of cancer. Some of you do though, don't you? You know the pains of cancer. You know the pain of death. You know the pain when a loved one says, I'm through, I'm walking away. Down to the very pain of a splinter in our finger. Jesus understands pain. So when Hebrew says, Jesus was perfected, it's so He can fully walk in the shoes that you walk in. So he could understand entirely what you deal with. Why did he have to suffer? Why could God not have snapped his fingers and caused sin to disappear? Why could God not have have dulled the senses of Jesus and let Jesus hang on the cross and say, oh, this is like a cool summer day. Why could that not have occurred? Because Jesus wouldn't have understood. He wouldn't have known what it's like to live life like you do. But Jesus also had to suffer for our perfection. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18. Knowing that you were ransomed, ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but you were, you were ransomed with the precious blood of Christ like that of a lamb without spot or blemish. And if you go a little further in 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, He Himself bore our sins in His body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By His wounds you have been what? Healed. You were like straying sheep, but now you return to the shepherd and the overseer of your souls. We are made perfect through the suffering that Jesus endured. And I love what we're told here in 1 Peter. 
You see, the greatest sickness that exists in this world is a sickness that we often don't talk about. We talk about cancer. We talk about disease. We talk about the Ohio Valley crud. But do we talk about sin? And do we realize that sin is the greatest sickness within us? That it is what keeps us separate from God? And what we are told here in 1 Peter is that our sins were passed from us to Jesus Christ on the cross. And so when He was on the cross hanging there, the weight that He bore was not just the weight of His body, but it was the weight of that bad word that we said 20 years ago so that we could be forgiven of it. It's the weight of the forgiveness of the sins that we will yet to commit in our life. The sins that are still coming. So like a parent looking to a child saying, I want to take your sickness away. That cough that you have that's keeping you up that sniffly nose, that fever that you're carrying, I want to take it on. And Jesus was in the place to be able to do it. Except the sickness was that of sin. God couldn't just forgive sin. He couldn't snap His fingers. and I guess He could, but then that would mean He wasn't just. And God is a God of justice as well. Someone had to pay for those sins. And I don't know about you, but I'm thankful to Jesus that it's not me having to pay for those sins. You see, ever since the beginning of time, when wrong was committed, someone had to die. Even in the Garden of Eden, after Adam and Eve ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, what happened? God killed an animal to make for them clothing. Something died so they would have covering over their nakedness. And we still, as people, still need to be clothed. Our world is a world that really sees this. How much sin do we see in our world? And let's just rephrase it for a moment because the world doesn't call it sin. They call it your choice, your right, your permission, your ability, your freedom. I have the freedom to do things that is not right or is not good, but they're my right. They're my freedom to do. And what happens in a world where I can do what I want to do? What happens to a world where my truth is my truth and there is no one else's truth that truly matters? You see... We are lost people floating in a world of hatred. Because when I don't have to love you, when I'm not called to love you, I only have to care about what I want. I only have to be concerned about me. Isn't that the evolutionary process? Survival of the fittest. And if I'm the strongest, then I'll be the one that makes it. Our world's filled with it in various places and in various ways. But the call of Christ is the call of love. It's the call that I care enough about you that I will sacrifice whatever it takes for you. The example in the crucifixion is that the love that God had for us is a love that says, I will go to whatever degree to ensure that you have what you need. And so today, The suffering of Christ is not for us to sit and look sorrowfully at. It's not for us to sit and to say, oh man, look what He did. 1 Peter tells us, He bore our sins so that we would no longer live in our sins, but that we would live in what? Y'all are whispering and I hear whispers. Righteous, right, thank you, righteousness. Jesus died. Not so we would marvel at the pain. Not so that we would sit and feel bad. I don't think He would want us to do that. But I do believe that He wants us to look and to say, 
How can I live rightly because of what God has done for me? This exact moment is the time when Jesus dies, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. It's the moment that the Passover lamb was sacrificed. Just as the Passover lamb was bleeding out, so our Savior did. And the Passover lamb, if you can remember your Old Testament for a moment, was the blood that was put on the doorpost that kept the angel of death from entering into the home of Egypt. The blood on the doorpost was the blood, the sign that told the angel not to enter that home. That that home was protected by God. And the imagery is that God stood in the door holding death back. Friends, the Passover lamb, Jesus, stands in the doorway today if you have the blood on the doorpost. And the fear of death, the reality of death, the sacrifice that comes for all of us is not there when the Passover lamb stands in the doorway of your heart. So this morning, my question for you is, is the blood of that sacrifice covering your heart? Is Jesus the one who clothes you and protects you? Jesus' blood is still the blood that maintains your safety. This morning, I don't know where you're at in life. I don't know what Jesus means to you. But I do know this. He suffered greatly for you and for me. But He didn't suffer so that I would sit here and not do anything. He didn't suffer so that I would sit quietly at my house. He suffered so that I would live rightly. So that I would pursue godliness. So that I would become something in the kingdom of God. Mason Phelps has our application prayer this morning. I'm going to go ahead and ask Mason to make his way forward. As he comes, we're going to pray. And after the prayer, if there's something that we can help you with, come find me. Bow with me, please. Dear God, um, as we go about our day today, please let us just remember the sacrifice that you and your son made for everybody, um, past and present and in the future, um, for the sins that everybody's committed. Um, and let us remember the, the terrible suffering that your son went through and that he didn't have to go through it, but he went through it because he loved us and you love us. And just let us keep that in mind as we go about Easter and um, let us try and go make some new Christians out in the world. In your sons, let me pray. Amen.